headshots. Why are headshots so hard? I'm not sure anyone loves making them. We all probably cringe a bit when we have to create them and shoot them and send them out for use. At least I do. But that's one of the reasons the art of photo retouching is so important. And when it comes to having my own headshot, check this out. Here's the before and here's the after. And while I'm much happier with the after, the truth is I made this photo with AI and I did all the retouching 10 times faster than the old way. Wanna know how? Well, the story all starts with an old Burger King slogan that got it so right. Have it your way, have it your way. Remember that campaign? I loved it because well, I love burgers, but more importantly, having it our way is exactly what we want when we're in the creative process. But when I use generative AI models to create, even though the results look good, I'm not sure I'm getting it my way, at least not with today's technology. After the initial excitement of generating text and visuals wears off, and I wanna manipulate the results to better fit a known objective, I feel like I lose control and it's not my way at all. And that got me thinking, how does AI even work? What makes generative AI actually generate at all? Would I feel better about this problem of AI taking jobs if I could better understand where the threat actually is, or if there even is one? Well, we've all probably toyed around with text prompt AI. You input a vision using a text prompt. Let's see, an Italian nerdy man with black glasses is recording a YouTube video in his home. He's looking directly at the camera. His room is dark with a strong neutral key light. The background has two warm Edison lights on a shelf full of knickknacks like old film cameras, books on filmmaking, and a projector. The aspect ratio is 16 by nine. Okay, let's see how that goes. AI tools like Midjourney deliver several results to choose from, often impressive images that are photo real. But when it returns a result, the system is essentially asking you, are any of these renderings what you meant? Well, if the results aren't your way, then you retry. This makes text prompt generative AI a fantastic tool for brainstorming, but I realize I spend more and more time trying to find combinations in editing my text or the weight of my prompts to better explain what I can see in my mind. Something, by the way, I could easily do in a conversation with a creative collaborator. It's easy for AI to understand the essence of my request, but having it really feel that it's my way, well, that's a different story. And here's the kicker. AI tools aren't built with memories. And, and I might regret saying this because I admit what I'm about to say may not be true in the future, but as of right now, it's basically impossible today for AI to create consistently over long durations. And think about what that means. The longer the story, the less consistent. That's why AI works so well in short form. It's excellent at stills and creating realistic and artistic moments, but these moments tend to be somewhat abstract, ideal for references, lookbooks, ads, trailers, or music videos, but ultimately, they're very difficult to replicate or version. And as the narrative story becomes longer with reoccurrences, the ability to hold constant aspects of the story that are revisited, such as characters, locations, or prompts, continuity becomes so inconsistent, they're basically unreliable. But why is that? Well, to understand the answer, we should learn a little bit more about what AI is and how it works. Disclaimer, this is not at all a fully comprehensive engineering download of AI, and I'm not an engineer, but if you're a creative, the following information might help familiarize you with a few key terms that have a high likelihood of impacting your work in some way. So we might as well start with a mic drop. AI isn't really AI at all. There are people who will invite a healthy debate that AI doesn't yet exist, and the tools we refer to as AI aren't legitimately artificially intelligent. Rather, they're the outcome of teaching computers how to analyze data and provide results. This isn't AI, it's machine learning. They take the data they've been trained on and can synthesize that to respond to instructions quickly. But they aren't thinking it up themselves. If something doesn't exist, the machines can't learn it and therefore can't generate it until humans generate it first. Agreed, that's a big topic to unravel, but for the sake of simplicity, and since people call it AI, we've decided to do the same to stifle confusion. But the truth is, we're really talking about ML. Next, AI is not a program. It's not an app or even an API. AI is more like a calculation, similar to the square root button on a calculator. Enter a number, push the button, and it runs the calculation assigned to that key. But it's not the whole calculator. You don't say get the square root machine. 
But there lies the problem for narrative storytellers. AI models are trained with data to provide results, but those results aren't input instantly back into the models for new calculations, which means they struggle with being able to repeat the same thing twice. Imagine walking through a park and seeing two caricature artists. You decide to have both of them draw a picture of you at the same time. Even though you're the same person sitting in the same bench with the same expression and lighting, the result will be two independent cartoons with different interpretations of what you look like. This is why the same instructions in AI will yield different results. Look at the image we rendered earlier. If I run the exact same prompt over and over and over, I keep getting results that in one way are the same, but in another way, they're totally different. Sure, they're similar, but not similar enough to ever reuse in the same narrative that requires continuity. And what is that? And who is that? See, if I can't get even the same exact prompt to get the same result, the technology seems far away for it to be able to give me the same character in a different scene. For narrative stories, this alone is a big problem that needs to be solved in order to maintain continuity. Now, academics can break AI into a lot more categories, but I think what creatives need to be aware of are two major types of models, large models and fine-tuned models. Large models like ChatGPT and MidJourney are trained on large amounts of data, millions and millions of assets and millions of dollars in compute, whereas fine-tuned models are smaller and only provide results to specific, narrower requests. ChatGPT is more specifically a large language model, or LLM. Large language models act as an interface between a human and a computer, and it's what makes it feel like you're talking to a person when using ChatGPT. By training the model on such vast amounts of data, it allows it to understand things like nouns, questions, and sentence structures. Which, by the way, helps explain why these models aren't actually artificially intelligent. Rather, they're machines that are learning. So how are these different? Well, think of large models like the food court at a mall. There's a lot of choices from several cuisines and tons of raw materials made available to create a wide variety of choices. But when you want it your way, well, what if you have a taste for something not available at the food court? A fine-tuned model is more like an Italian restaurant known for its mastacholi. At this restaurant, you can't get a taco or a milkshake, but if it's mastacholi you're looking for, it's perfect every time even though the menu is limited compared to the food court. So now that we understand some of the basics of how AI works, the big question is which of these AI models is most beneficial to creatives? Large models or fine-tuned models? We've placed our bet here at Strata. Can you guess which? When it comes to workflow, generative AI is going to be useful to artists, but the biggest opportunity I see is optimizing fine-tuned models to automate workflow tasks. That's what we're trying to build here. A way to reduce or even eliminate tasks that we normally do by hand that slow us down so we can get to the important creative parts faster. And here's an example of how. I can give a large model like Midjourney an image of myself and my objective is to do some retouching to clean up some blemishes on my skin. Even though I can provide it my image and ask it to remove blemishes and smooth out my skin, the model struggles to zero in on very specific tasks and remove wrinkles in clothing or eyes or make it look like I sleep more. In fact, it gets confused. It takes a long time to render the results and while I admit the skin is smoother, sort of, this isn't even a picture of me anymore. Now, let's try the same task on a fine-tuned model like Evoto. Evoto is the next generation of photo retouching and uses AI to simplify complex retouching work in record time and gets it right on the first try. I love Evoto because it's so easy. I don't have to Google my way through special touch-up hints to fix problems that are complicated. Here's why this is such a breakthrough. Until now, retouching apps were built to give you a number of tools and filters to cut out layers so you can use them in combination to improve an image. Evoto doesn't do that. Instead, it uses a fine-tuned AI model to break down an image into categories as if it automatically and invisibly sliced up your image into individual layers. And then you use sliders to increase or decrease the effect of that particular slice. This is a perfect example of where AI can help artists by skipping the time required to create masks, layers, and blurs. For example, you could do complex adjustments like reduce wrinkles on skin, which are separate from wrinkles on a shirt. You can adjust smile lines separate from lines on a forehead, bags under eyes. Avoto has already qualified small areas like teeth and eyes so you can make fine changes to them without having to create any masks or feathers or even name them. As I click between the before and after, I end up with professional results that I'm used to getting, but now I'm getting them 10 times faster using Avoto. 
Now to drive the point home even more, let me do that again, but from scratch. No speed effects here, this is all real time. In episode eight, we went to Amsterdam to the IBC conference and did some interviews, which means jet lag which is clearly evident in this photo since I only arrived the day before. And in less than 20 seconds, a photo lets me remove a lot of that jet lag because it's already qualified eye wrinkles and dark circles. It also did my ironing by removing wrinkles in my shirt. And that means we have time left over to deal with the red trade show lights spilling onto my face. I can use Avoto to do traditional color correction with a host of tools. Avoto has color presets, full histogram, and HSL settings for precision color correction. I also have tools for lens distortion and vignettes. I end up with the same professional results I'm used to getting, but I'm getting them five to 10 times faster using Avoto. As I click between the before and after, it goes without saying, there are many tools to get the same results, but I've retired the old way because Avoto is simply more intuitive and undeniably faster. Now, armed with this knowledge, do you see where the problem is with long form narrative storytelling? If you haven't watched episode seven, you really should because we examined how large language models are problematic in storytelling because while they're really good at solving problems, they're really poor at creating them, which is what makes stories interesting to watch. And now we realize what large visual models are good at. They can generate realistic moments, but they struggle to repeat critical elements of continuity. And when a director tells a story, even if it has a hundred different locations with dozens of actors, they can't help but pollute each image with their own personality and aesthetic and style, making the entire film, regardless of how random, feel like it fits together. This is exactly what I mean when I say, have it your way. You can't get that in a text prompt because one, you can't remember to describe all of your intent in every prompt. Two, you aren't even consciously aware of all of your intent. And three, even if you could capture it all, AI would still give you different results. There's nothing wrong with using large AI models. They can certainly reproduce compelling and realistic images, but they can't generate the controlled details needed for long form narrative production. But AI can be extremely useful when the need is all about controlling fine details. And even better, when AI can do the types of tasks that are always just kind of in the way. Imagine having every fine tuned model at your fingertip so you not only can automate the slow stuff, you can make your images exactly as they were in your mind with less time and effort. Improving creative control is the heart of our mission and we invite you to sign up to be an early adopter at strata.tech. But in order for strata to become that creative companion that we want it to be, creative control must remain in the hands of the artist. I love how AI is helping me uplevel my work, but I wanna be in the driver's seat. And there's more than one reason creatives want to be in that driver's seat. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way to control how everyone on my team can use AI to collaborate with me, making sure that the results are my way every time.